Today we're going to be top tackling an extremely ambitious topic, which is the economics of good and evil. And that was the title of a book that came out a few years ago, written by my guest today. He is uh, also uh, an economics professor at Charles University in Prague and a former economic advisor to Václav Havel, Thomas Sedlacek. Thomas, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Now, let's start with this fascinating story that you write a lot about, which is uh, Joseph in the Old Testament oh, yeah. and his dream about the seven fat cows and the seven lean cows, which, as I understand it, you're suggesting is uh, the first biblical imprimatur for a form of Keynesianism. Ex explain to me where this comes from. Yeah, yeah. So what I mean, so my, my lay hobby is sort of looking through ancient texts and literature before, right. way before we had economics. There mm. were similar problems and people would, you know, instead of putting them in mathematical models, they would put them in, in stories. Right. At the end of the day, it's also a model, just mm. doesn't use so much mathematics. So this is right. the first business cycle in the written history of mankind that I have found really nicely describing seven years of you know, GDP growth and right. seven years of GDP decline. And um, Pharaoh wants to know how should we treat that economy. Right. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, Joseph really gives him a, a Keynesian answer sort of, you know, decrease the amplitude of business, business cycle. So you can see nicely how, you know, they would say it in a story, and today Keynes said pretty much the same thing, but uh, in a different realm. Now, it's very interesting that you take these religious concepts as also having economic meanings. And one thing that fascinates me is that the word debt, the word for debt is the same as the word for sin in a number of the languages in which the, the early Bibles were written. Yes. Well, why, what implications does that have for us today? I mean, is, are we saying that, that economics in its modern form is, a, is, a, is its own value system which is different from the previous one? Yes, economics behaves or pretends to be a science that's technical, non-religious, non very objective, mm. value-free. But what in fact we are buying when we're listening to economists is a value system that gives you norms. So I call it the unorchestrated orchestrator. You mustn't orchestrate it. Laissez faire, laissez passer, don't you touch it. It has an, a logic, right. knowledge, divine sort of system of its own. It will tell you what to do. So, it, so for example, it tells you that egoism is okay, that, that human beings are rational, that you can actually, you should, you should enjoy, you should actually maximize your utility, which is, which is a huge sort of debate that we had here in, in, in between the totalitarians. And all of which is a, bit of a, is a departure from the Judeo-Christian set of values which yeah. set itself set itself out in the So Bible. exactly so we have a new I even call it uh, uh, economic ethics it's a new religion or you could almost or mm. value system whatever you want to call it that um, smuggled um, many norms without the proper dis d debate right. this is what I this is what I mind that uh, we are we are you know buying a belief system which pretends not to be a belief system okay and if we go back to the belief system that we started in Another point that you make that fascinates me is that uh, particularly Jesus often talks in economic and material terms in his, in his parables. I mean, is there, is there a sense in which the, uh, the founding documents of Judaism and Christianity really were meant as being economic guides? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would even go as far as to say that if you separate the two, sort of the, the soul from the body, yeah. the body of economic, the technical, from the, from the soul, the, the culture, the beliefs, and... Mm values, it, none of it will make sense. Economics will lose its sense because it will be like a zombie, you know, very efficient, but not the way you want it to. It, it, it will work like zombies work, but they work against us. If, they, if, if you deprive a human body of a soul, you get a zombie. On the other hand, if you separate the body from the soul, you also get something that's scary and that's a ghost. So today, right. if you separate the two, you get religion that's ridiculously blameful and absolutely irrelevant because it has no material right. to sort of play with. And you have a body that works very efficiently, but like a zombie against humanity. So my little sort of role is to try and see it, it makes much more sense if you actually put it back together. And this example of debt is, is, is a great example because mm. sin and debt are in the original languages in the same word. Now, let's, uh, maybe one or two viewers will be waiting for something practical to emerge out of this. We are, of course, still in the aftermath of one of the greatest debt yes. crises in almost a century. What implications does this have for your views as an economist as to how we should actually deal with the current situation that front confronts us with all these fears about debt deflation, fears about uh, inflation due to the printing of money? What is the read-through to our current economic predicament? Well, 
one way how to read this is that as a generation, we have been selling stability in mm. order to buy speed, which is uh, exactly something that in which we succeeded. We've Great. created very fast-growing economies that are very, uh, they're, not, they're, not, they're not stable. It's very easy mm. to sort of disbalance them. You can see this wonderfully with this, um, with this whole notion of debt. Yeah. The economy, or, or the whole Western economy, is so indebted that we cannot take another crisis. If, and, and you know, since the time immemorial, the economy has been going in cycles. Should the next one come before we really quickly decrease the level mm. of debt, it could literally destroy our civilization. So uh, my imperative, a practical imperative, is yeah. exactly to start the reverse, start selling growth and buy back stability. So this notion, this materialist notion that there is something good about GDP is something that has to be jettisoned, which will make some quite a lot of people uncomfortable, but similarly also there needs yeah. to be some moral imperative or yeah. practical imperative to pay off debt. So, so um, 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 moral imperative is you should not enjoy everything that you can enjoy. In other words, you should not do everything that you can do. Right. So what we've done, there is a story of, of Pharaoh, and Joseph advised to Pharaoh was during the seven fat years, do not consume everything that grows, but save a little bit. In other words, create a little bit of a constraint for yourself, and that will mm -hmm. give you energy, which you can then use in, in the bad years. And we have exactly not done this, and the, quest the whole question is whether we as a, you know, very spoiled or addicted to growth society, whether we can do this. Um, it could also be that we're just used to, you know, going higher, 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 but this, in, in, in a cyclical economy, mm. this doesn't work. This creates a whole new set of problems, which must be uh, addressed from within. So we ourselves have to say, right. sort of, enough. Enough will never come from the outside. You can see this nicely even in the Garden of Eden, right. which is the fantasy. This is the, you know, the most beautiful fantasy of mankind that you can find in religions is these sort of gardens of Eden that were created before the fall. And even there you see, even though the context was perfect, people were not happy. They consumed something they didn't have to consume. They consumed the fruit. Right. And, and uh, so this brings me to an idea that we have to be almost pitiless censors of ourselves because we have no other barriers to limit us. We need to do that limiting okay. ourselves. Which is, which is a very different concept from the classical uh, rational economic man that's assumed in the models. Yes. I have one final question. Um, many people will be fascinated by what you've been saying. Just, just to be clear, are you, are you suggesting that, that these basic ideas about how we deal with deficits and so on, how we deal with growth, come from some, spring from some belief in the Bible? Or are you saying that these are imminent attitudes, approaches to the economy, which we can see go back many thousands of years and which we shouldn't necessarily jettison. Yes, the, the second. I mean, right. uh, uh, I you're not saying Jesus would have been a deficit hawk. You're saying no, no, no. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a mixture. You can see. I'm starting with the Epic of Gilgamesh, hmm. which is a Babylonian sort of a narrative that really influenced that a lot. But we don't know much about that. And then hmm. there is this, you know, Greek philosophy, the Stoics versus the utilitarians. One would right. say, and then there is uh, the the Hebrew influence from the Bible, and it all mixes and other influences. My role is to try to decode them and to see. What, where, does these, where do these ideas actually come from? And you can see that the similar debate that we're finding ourselves in has been something that they've been debating in, in ancient Egypt. And it's interesting to see, and this is why I like to read these texts, because it really gets you out of the box. Um, one fascinating story, one read of this uh, story of Egypt, uh, sorry, the story of Joseph, yes. is that they, they managed to go as a primitive society some 3,000 years ago, that's how yeah. the, all the stories, they went through a very severe uh, depression where famine was at hand without a single penny of debt. Right. You know, because they saved. So today, this is completely outside of the fantasy, even, of our debate, because the only way how we can cure, or how we think we can cure, uh, a depression is, you know, flooded with, flooded with money through debt. So it's a debt crisis, which the only way how we can solve it is more debt. So this also shows you how addicted, right. it's like an alcoholic who tries to solve his alcoholism by drinking. Okay, <laughs> Thomas, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. It has been a deep pleasure. I will be fascinated to find out what the viewers out there have made of all of this. I think the, the key point, though, to make is that, uh, 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 and one which I, I think everyone can agree with, that there is an implicit value system in economics, and perhaps we should be much more aware of that imposed value system that is made when modern economic models uh, promulgated.